just a few months ago i was in america and as many of you know in america it's quite easy to have and carry guns <coughs> and while people feel that that's what they need for their safety it also means that somebody who is trigger happy can actually cause enormous damage to others so now we may not be having a gun physically but we all have a, not just a gun but a loaded gun inside us and that gun is our tongue now, a physical gun can discharge bullets which can which can injure people's bones but a tongue can discharge words that can break people's hearts and just as a person who had a gun would have to be extremely conscious how i am going to use it similarly we need to be careful about how we are using the power of speech at one level we understand that it's important to learn how to speak we learn may talk about fluency we talk about vocabulary but it's also that through the power of speech now when when speech used positively it can be encouraging it can be inspiring it can be very powerfully transformative positively and negatively it can be demoralizing it can be devastating sometimes people can be so hurt by a few words and it can just we might just speak one word in a, in a just a rush of blood and impulse and those words may be replay in people's minds for the rest of their life it can have a permanent corrosive effect on their self understanding on their vision of what they can do in their lives and if we are representing a we are a part of a spiritual tradition we are trying to share spiritual wisdom that responsibility becomes all the more so speech is extremely powerful and the bhagavad gita so that's the first part the power of speech so the bhagavad gita in its 17th chapter 15th text talks about principles by which we can use this power effectively so it says it gives broadly four characteristics of speech that is effective and those four characteristics can be put into two broad categories one is the speech is sensible and second is it is sensitive so sensible that is what applies to our that is what appeals to our head to our rational part and sensitive is what appeals to our heart to our emotional part and if we are to communicate effectively whether it is we are parents communicating with our child whether we are we are individuals communicating to with our significant other in a relationship or with just friends colleagues Now, to the extent our speech can incorporate both these things the sensible appears to the reason within us and the sensitive appeals to the emotion within us so krishna in the bhagavad gita i am going to speak based on this verse 1715 so anudvega karam vakyam satyam priya hitam chayat so as far as sensible the gita gives two characteristics it is truthful and it is helpful and as far as sensitive it says it is non agitating and it is pleasing so we could say that these are spectrums at the very least when we speak try to speak in a way that does not agitate others the world is a tough place to live in everybody has difficulties in their life and the least we can do to try to alleviate others difficulties 
is to not speak in a way that adds to their talk. So sometimes when people speak sarcastically, people insult each other. No, there is, there is fun where people are sparring with each other. But there are some, sometimes things that come off as mean-spirited insults. And that can be very hurtful. So at the very least, if you want to consider like a spectrum, it's like a funnel. At the very least, let it be non-agitating. And in its best, if what we can speak is also pleasing. So pleasing means, pleasing does not necessarily mean flattering others. That's why the other component is talking about it's truthful. When I mean, you flatter someone, at that time it's very clear, maybe that person will believe us at that time. But reality has a way of asserting itself. If somebody is, somebody, if somebody has such singing ability, and the best way they can do justice to their ability is by never singing. <laughs> they have basically no singing ability. Then telling them you are a great singer. Now that is not just being sensitive. That is just being misleading them. You might be flattering them. So that's not what the Gita is talking about. Being sensitive, being pleasing is not flattering. Because the other side is, it's truthful. So, but in general, everybody needs encouragement in the world. They said life is discouraging. So when the Gita uses the word pleasing, it is a it is essentially in the mood of encouraging. We not that we pamper and speak falsehoods, but we speak in a way that which by which we assert their humanity, their dignity, their spirituality, and infuse them with some hope, uplift their hearts. That's one side. And similarly, we could say it's like another funnel over here. The speech that we have is truthful. But along with truthful, it's good to be truthful, but it's also helpful. Now, not every truth is helpful, isn't it? Suppose say we have been in a long time relationship with someone, maybe 30 years of a relationship, and now it is their birthday, and you say, Now today I will give you a gift. That will change your life. Just in, what is that? In the last 30 years, all the faults that I've observed in you, I will tell all of them to you today. <laughs> then you can improve yourself. You can learn and grow. Well, that you know, if say if we are if uh, we are sitting under a hill near, near, at the foot of a hill, and like a little drop of water falls, we wake up. That's if you are dozing off, maybe a few drops of water falling is good. But if a huge waterfall comes, it just sweeps away as a way and it drowns us. So maybe one or two falls being told here and there is fine. So, but everything being told at one time is that's not helpful. So we have to be truthful, but speak the truth in a way that is helpful. Okay, what is going to help this person rise from where they are to the next step? There we have a, we have a small child and the child is struggling with math. This is this arithmetic, you know. It's uh, how do you subtract a bigger number from a small number? I just don't get it. Since you don't get something so simple, in future you will have to study triple integral calculus. This is a 30 page book, you'll have to study a 3000 page book. And maybe is to study that in the future. But if you tell them, they'll say, okay, I, I quit arithmetic right now. So not all truths are helpful. So basically, to the extent we can incorporate these four aspects. We speak in a way that at least non-agitating, at best it is pleasing and courage. And it is truthful, but it is also helpful. So now, sometimes in our speech, we may have only one of these op components. So if we are only sensible and not sensitive, then what happens? It is we come off as heartless. It's like, I'm explaining to you this is wrong and this is right. Why don't you understand it? You know, our conceptions, our opinions, 
they wow. often become a part of who we are. So we are not like computers where there's some wrong data deleted and replaced with new data. It doesn't work like that. So when we are only sensible, we're only rational, but we're not sensitive. Then we are treating others basically like computers. This wrong data replaced with the right data. But what happens is, and we treat people like that, people don't replace the data, they replace us as a data source. And just go to somewhere else. So we are, we are only rational, we come up with heartless. On the other hand, if we are only sensitive, then we may end up becoming headless. Sometimes to speak and be helpful, we have to speak some hard truths. Some truths are bitter. Of course, that does not mean that we have to speak them bitterly. But it has to be spoken. On a, the Guru of Shila Prabhupada, Bhakti Sankara, I will give the example that if somebody is maybe distracted, is walking near the parapet wall or the edge of a tall building, hey, don't go there, it's too close to the wall. You scream, don't go there, you'll fall. Now, we at that time, it's an emergency, we have to help that person. So, being only sensitive without being sensible, that can make us heartless. This is where sometimes political correctness goes to the very extreme, where people just don't speak the truth at all. So, the ideal is where there's a balance of sensitive, sensible plus sensitive. When both of these go together, then that is when we can actually be effective in our speech. And in fact, this is what Krishna does in the Bhagavad Gita. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is at one level a philosophical book. And philosophical book means you have to give wisdom. But the way Krishna gives wisdom is very revealing. Generally, we think that if somebody is wrong, I have to set them right. Just give them the right knowledge. Yes, giving the right knowledge is important. But it's not just telling them what is the right thing to do. But it's also giving them the inspiration that actually you can do it. So if you consider the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna starts speaking from 2.11 in the Bhagavad Gita. And he stops speaking at 1872. Mm -hmm. Uh, in between, Arjuna asked some questions and there are a lot of things going on. But in fact, if you see the last six, last seven verses, nine verses basically, from 211 to 1863, that is where Krishna's focus is primarily on enlightenment. And in the last eight verses, last nine verses, 64 to 72, it is on encouragement. So at 1863, Krishna tells Arjuna, now I have given you my message. Now you deliberate and do as you desire. So basically this enlightenment is largely about being sensible. And encouragement is about being sensitive. So Krishna in one sense walks his talk or rather he talks his talk. The way he says we should talk, he demonstrates. So, briefly I'll talk. What happens? 1863, Krishna tells Arjuna, now you deliberate and do as you desire. So at this point, Arjuna becomes thoughtful. Krishna has spoken so many things throughout the Gita. You know, what does Krishna want me to do? It's like a doctor who, some patient has a serious problem. and The doctor has given the the prognosis, the diagnosis, the various treatment options and says, okay, now you do as you desire. The patient will start thinking, my God, you know, should I do chemotherapy, should I do radiotherapy, should I go to natural therapy, natural therapy, this, this, that. It can be quite overwhelming. So Arjuna becomes like that in the Gita. And at that point, when two people are very close to each other, sometimes but just by their eyes, by the glance in their eyes, they can speak volumes. No, they just speak something. Yeah. Then, yeah. One, one person's eyes are asking, should you do this? Yeah. And somebody who doesn't know, they just see the eyes meeting, they don't understand anything. So like that, Krishna and Arjuna are very close friends. 
So there are many places in the Bhagavad Gita there are no articulated questions, but there are unspoken questions and there are unspoken answers over there. So at this point, 1863, Arjuna asked Krishna without articulating the question. He says, Krishna, what do you want me to do? In 1863, Arjuna is Krishna Arjuna, now you do as you desire. Krishna respects Arjuna's intelligence. But Arjuna is saying, what do you want me to do? It's like a doctor telling the patient, now you do what you desire. Uh, say there's a child who is sick and the child's parents are there. And they tell him, now you do as now you do as you desire, whatever treatment you would like to give your child. And the parents ask, Doctor, if this was your child, what treatment would you give? So Arjuna is like that. And then Krishna speaks. See, 18, 64, 65, 66. Each of these verses is overflowing with Krishna's love for Arjuna. Krishna says in 1864, He says, Now I am going to speak the most confidential knowledge to you. That which is the highest truth. That which I speak to you because you are dear to me. That which I speak because I seek your benefit. This is the best thing. And this verse actually is filled with, it's almost like Krishna bearing his heart and revealing his love to Arjuna. Krishna is telling, I am not just a dispassionate educator. I am an impassioned lover. I care for you. And therefore I am telling you this. And then Krishna speaks. Subsequent verses. Manmana bhavmat bhakto. Just become my devotee. Worship me. Surrender to me. And then sarva dharma and parityanjama mekam sharanam raja. And he says, I will take care of all problems. Aham tuam sarupa pebhya mukshisham. He's like a doctor saying, you just take this treatment. If there are any complications, I will make sure that all the complications are addressed. So that is Krishna giving reassurance, encouragement to Arjuna. So this is how we can also, by seeking this balance between the rational content in our speech and the emotional side of our speech, we can also demonstrate or follow Krishna's teachings. And what is the effect? Krishna's speech is so invigorating that Arjuna's heart is transformed. Arjuna picks up his bow in readiness to fight. Karishe vachinam tava. I will do your will. So, at the start of the Gita, Arjuna's bow is down. I can't fight. Arjuna's bow represents our enthusiasm, our determination, our confidence. Sometimes life can be so discouraging. Say, I just quit. I can't do it. But the Gita is it's just 700 verses. If somebody knows Sanskrit, the whole Gita's verses can be recited in about one, one and a half hours. If somebody went to a therapy session and then they went in, they were just completely depressed on the verge of an emotional breakdown. And they come out of the session, you know, jumping and bubbling with joy and energy. Hey, what did the therapist speak? What changes so much? So Arjuna is like that. Oh, Krishna is sorry, Krishna, Krishna, Arjuna is depressed at the start of the Gita. He's paralyzed, I can't do anything. But he's completely rejuvenated by the end of the Gita. That the power of speech is demonstrated by Krishna himself in the Bhagavad Gita. I'll give one more example of this. Uh, so I talk about the process. The process is that we balance the sensitive side and the sensible side. And the purpose ultimately is to uplift people from where they are to the next step. That's the purpose of speaking. It is not to prove that I am right and you are wrong. It is that let us all together, we both together make progress toward that which is right. I'll give one last example and let's stop. So in the, after the Bhagavad Gita is spoken, there is the war that happens in Kurukshetra. And on the 13th day, Arjuna faces a devastating loss. His son, beloved son Abhimanyu, is killed by the enemies through a brutal conspiracy. And Arjuna has gone to fight with a separate division. And when he comes back to the camp where they are all situated, he starts feeling 
some kind of bad feeling within us. Normally, when the warriors would come back, there would be celebratory music everywhere to welcome them back. This day, there was somber silence. And normally, the soldiers and the warriors would greet Arjuna with respect and good cheer. But this day, nobody would meet his eyes. Arjuna started feeling a pit in his stomach. What could have happened? Arjuna entered into the main tent where they would meet at the end of the day. And his eyes glanced over all the thrones where the various warriors would be sitting. And then he saw the throne of his son. It was empty. His heart stopped. Not wanting to believe the evidence of his eyes, he looked at the face of his eldest brother, Yudhishthira, and he could see tears streaking down his eyes. Arjuna's worst fears had come true. He collapsed on the ground in agony. His brother, Yudhishthira, came up to him and gently told the story about how or when you have been trapped and killed. Arjuna's agony as he heard the story gave way to anger. And in despair, he lashed out at his brothers. He said, are all of your weapons just ornaments? Could not one of you protect my son? Fire on you and your Kshatriya Vailar. Yudhishthir, he looked as if he had been whiplashed on the face. Arjuna's words were like that. At that time, Krishna came up to Arjuna and pulled him into a side hug. And Krishna said, Oh Arjuna, in this world, adversity befalls everyone, the wise and the unwise. What differentiates the wise from the unwise is that amid adversity, the unwise act in ways that make things worse, whereas the wise act in ways that make things better. Oh Arjuna, look at the faces of your brothers. They are in agony at the death of Abhimanyu, just as you are. Please don't speak words that will increase their agony. So here, what is Krishna doing? Krishna, what he is speaking is that, let's see how he applies this four principles what I'm talking about, sensitive and sensible. He could have talked about, Arjuna, I just taught the Bhagavad Gita to you. Just a few days ago, and the Bhagavad Gita said that you're not the body of the soul, only the foolish lament at death. Have you already forgotten the Bhagavad Gita? What kind of dumb person are you? That, for somebody who has lost a loved one, to just pile on them with philosophy can be heartless. So, it, it is truthful, but at that time it may not be helpful. Yeah, even if I know that, yeah, there's the soul and the soul lives on, but that person is no longer with me right now and I am experiencing that gnawing, yawning abyss, a hole in my heart. So, what is the truth that is helpful at that time? So, what Krishna does to Arjuna is take a very human approach. He does not say, your suffering is all illusion, your tears are all maya. He says, yeah, your distress comes upon everyone. The best that we can do is decrease the distress, not increase it. So, he acknowledges Arjuna's distress. So, in that sense, it's non-agitating. But he's saying, you can do something. Now the distress has come upon us, the adversity has come upon us. No, the only thing we can do is ensure that we don't increase it. So you don't increase it by speaking hurtful words. So he calls upon Arjuna's humanity, he calls upon Arjuna's heart. And from the philosophy, he could have spoken many things. But what he focuses on is the human agency. That... When bad things happen, we humans always have the free will. We are never completely helpless. Somebody may say, oh, I'm in a totally helpless situation. Well, my things are so bad, I can't do anything about them. Well, maybe 
If things are very bad, can you make them worse? See, what kind of question is that? If things are bad, who would want to make them worse? But the point is, can we make them worse? Well, yes. No matter how bad things are, we never lose the power to make them worse. <laughs> and if we can make things worse, then we can make them better also. We are not as powerless as we think. So what is Krishna doing in his message to Arjuna? He is being sensible. But the sensible is, he is appealing to our sense of human responsibility. See, most of us, most people are basically good at the heart. They don't want to intentionally hurt others. I mean, they're just hurt and they're hurting others because of that. But if they become, they're made aware in a gentle way you're hurting others, then they will, they will not. See, up, and the sensitive part is, is he acknowledges Arjuna's pain. But then he also points out others' pain. And points out that others are also in pain. So that way, if we can follow and this book, Krishna, Krishna is the principle and Krishna is the practice of how each one of us can, when others are in distress, we try to speak in a way that is ultimately uplifting for them. There is a balance of being sensible and sensitive. And it's a, it's a slow process. I'm speaking all this, but I also frequently make mistakes. It ends up being either too sensible or too, or too sensitive or not sensible. But we all learn by experience. Just keep moving on this journey. We can tap the power of speech more and more effectively. And by that, we can improve the quality of our relationships, the quality of our outreach. And we can improve the quality of our corner of the world where we live. So I'll summarize. I spoke three main points. I talked first about the power of speech that our tongue is like a loaded gun and we are anyway discharging something with the gun of our tongue so let's learn how we don't discharge bullets unintentionally and then the process for tapping that power of the tongue is we balance that being sensible with being sensitive so sensible means it's like a funnel where we are truthful, but not just truthful, we speak those truths that are helpful. And then sensitive means we try to speak in a way that is non-agitating and not just non-agitating, it's also we try to speak in a way that is pleasing, that means encouraging. So, and last part we discussed is the purpose is ultimately to ease others life journey in whatever way we can. We don't want to worsen it, we want to ease it. I have discussed two examples of Krishna and Arjuna in the Gita itself and in the Mahabharata on the death of Abhimanyu. So thank you very much. Hare Thank you so much, Prabhu. And we're about to move on to Kirtan now. Are you racing straight off? You've got another commitment or you're here for a little while? Yeah, I'll be here for a few minutes. And I also have a couple of books if any of you like to have. A bunch of what I spoke today, we have books. So can I encourage then if uh, anyone has a question for Prabhu that they can meet in your book table that's just here? Yeah, do we have the A big thank you for uh, coming especially to grace us with your wisdom. And let's hear a big round of applause for people.